Philippians 2, verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. O Lord, have mercy on us. And now a reading from John 19, verse 25. John 19, 25. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. In the name of Jesus, amen. We can say without much exaggeration that freedom has been modernity's chief preoccupation. Descartes and Kant called for freeing oneself from the fetters of unexamined opinion. Both rejected reliance on external authorities and taking things on faith. Dare to use your reason was Kant's slogan. Marx spoke of the liberation of the exploited working class, so that work might become an expression of human dignity. Freud's goal was to free the individual from an oppressive past buried in the subconscious. And Nietzsche and Feuerbach advocated freedom from God as an idea stifling human self-expression and will. In this polyphony of calls to freedom, Modernity has found its identity, its dream and its promise, but also its annoyingly elusive goal, a ceaseless undertaking and a doom. For freedom, even when won at a great cost, requires constant maintenance and often morphs into its very opposite, breeding oppressive systems and legalisms. Hitler, too, proclaimed nothing but freedom. Freedom from national suffering and humiliation brought about by the Treaty of Versailles. Freedom from the corruption of public morality and the arts. Freedom from the people's pollution by those who are not true Germans. In Dietrich Bonhoeffer, we also find an advocate, a tireless advocate of freedom. But the freedom Bonhoeffer calls for is a different sort of freedom. Not a freedom among freedoms. Not just an idea in the marketplace of ideas. A freedom that displays its wares to lure us in, to persuade us that we should buy into it, that we should adopt its cause and march under its banners. Instead, here we have a freedom that envelops us, takes hold of us, and gives itself to us. Freedom not as a human task, but as a gift of God. Freedom that belongs, first of all, to God. And only as such, as God's freedom, and only by God's grace, without any merit or worthiness in us, a freedom that frees us for itself. Freedom like no other. 
What I hope to do this morning is tell you about this freedom. Two preliminary points are in order, however. Formally speaking, I can only do justice to freedom as Bonhoeffer came to understand it, when I seek not to persuade, but to proclaim. My aim is not to convince you that Bonhoeffer has an idea that holds water, that is worth your time and your pausing over. Rather, first and foremost, my goal is to announce this freedom in your hearing as a reality. Second, materially speaking, in order to speak of freedom as this most real of realities, we must begin not with our doing and our actions, but with God's act. For only as an act of God is freedom like no other. Bonhoeffer looks on God's freedom not as something static, as something that God simply possesses in God's unperturbed majesty. Rather, God's freedom is that which God reasserts within human history, which God brings into history, and does so against what humans would naturally expect from God, against our better judgment. Only thus, as he who himself first determines and asserts his freedom, does God share this freedom with us? At the dawn of the modern era, God was still very much at the center of our lives. But he was there, Bonhoeffer observes, because more often than not, we needed him to be there. We needed his power. For Descartes, the omnipotent God guaranteed that Descartes' own senses were not deceiving him about the existence of the world. Descartes had no doubt that he himself existed. But did the world? Only God, the perfect God, perfect on Descartes' own terms, could assure him of that. On a more mundane level, God was used to explain anything from milk not going bad to the motion of the stars. Long story short, at the dawn of modernity, it was easy, it was necessary to believe in God. Be that as it may, Bonhoeffer notes that to believe in God because human knowledge has come to an end, or because human resources fail, is to believe only in a stopgap God. God brought onto the scene either for the apparent solution of insoluble problems, or as a strength in human failure. And this is treacherous. For if in fact the frontiers of knowledge are being pushed further and further back, then God is being pushed back with them and is therefore continually in retreat. From a necessary God, necessary because our answers and our solutions were once so few, God becomes superfluous. Bonhoeffer doubts whether today even sin constitutes a genuine boundary and makes us turn to God. If noticed at all, sin is viewed largely as a moral shortcoming, and there is nothing that therapy and a better grip on oneself cannot overcome. Are we then left only with death, which people now hardly fear as the last frontier? Is this where we still might have some use for God? Bonhoeffer insists we must come to terms with the inescapable godlessness of our world. It will not do to exploit human weakness or human boundaries for the sake of religion. In his Romans commentary, Karl Barth describes people who do this as those who lack the courage of atheism. Bonhoeffer develops further this critique of religious people, as he calls them. Religious people believe they understand divine matters and have something to say in them. They are therefore trying anxiously to reserve some space for God, some area on the periphery of life where God might still be necessary and could be proven to be so. In effect, they take it upon themselves to save the credibility of God and the respectability 
of belief. More than that, they take it upon themselves to save the world for what they really fear are the worldly consequences were God to be no longer necessary. In no uncertain terms, Bonhoeffer finds such people intellectually dishonest. And that for two reasons. First, the highest, most powerful and best being imaginable, whose indispensability religious people argue for, is a God after their own heart, in their own image and likeness, a God elevated to divinity by human deficiency and anxiety, and so a God produced by our own imagination. A no God, as Barth would put it. Further, Bonhoeffer insists that it will not do to ignore that the world has come of age and that it no longer requires the working hypothesis of God. It is becoming evident, Bonhoeffer writes, that everything gets along without God, and in fact, just as well as before. In the scientific field and in human affairs generally, God is being pushed more and more out of life, losing more and more ground. And we cannot be honest unless we recognize not only that we live, but that we have to live in the world as if there were no God. It is at this critical juncture that Bonhoeffer makes a surprising move. He interprets the development of Western atheism as the action of God himself. God himself cleanses the world of the God who once was deceptively at the center of our lives, of our needy lives, but who we have learned to do so well without. It is none other than God who contends with the idol of our own making, the no God. So, writes Bonhoeffer, God would have us know that we must live as people who manage our lives without God. But precisely in this action, God, the true God, asserts his presence in the midst of the world. The God who lets us live in the world without the working hypothesis of God is the God before whom we stand continually. We stand in the very presence of God, not on the periphery of life, not just in need and distress and anxiety, not when knowledge fails, when we are weak or at our wit's end, but in the midst of it all, we stand in the presence of God. We live without God, before God and with God. What does this mean? It means, says Bonhoeffer, that we are to find God in what we know, not in what we don't know. God wants us to realize the divine presence not in unsolved problems, but in those that are solved. God is not a stopgap. God must be recognized at the center of life, and not only when death comes, in health and in vigor, and not only in suffering, in our activities and not only in sin. I should like to speak of God, Bonhoeffer writes elsewhere, in human life and goodness. But what is the basis of speaking of God in this way, in the midst of life? The basis is clearly not established by us. Our need can only give rise to an idol, a satisfier of some deficiency we perceive in ourselves, and in which we will soon be able to take care of ourselves, thank you very much. The God of our devising can only be a retreating God. The basis for God's presence at life's very center, in the midst of all life, can only be established by God himself. The same God who lets us manage without himself, who is not necessary, but precisely as such, not unnecessary, but more than necessary. And God has indeed established this basis. 
God, writes Bonhoeffer, lets the divine self be pushed out of the world and onto the cross. On the cross, God embraces and makes his own our humanity, together with our sin and our death and suffering, but also together with our health, with joys, with our answers and our solutions, and with all our daily busyness. All of life, in this cruciform way and in no other, the God of the Bible wins power and space in the world by weakness. The crucified is an embodiment of God's freedom, of God's self-determination to be for us and with us, to be in our midst as one of us, all this against our better judgment. For it is the God of human devising who must be kept aloof from the world, imprisoned in a metaphysical distance. He must remain untainted in his being by anything that doesn't belong, untainted by his creation and its history, disposing over it only by means of decrees and laws, untainted by our humanity and by our flesh, untainted by our sin and weakness. He must remain perfectly immutable, perfectly glorious and perfectly perfect, just as we imagine and just as we need him to be. For if he were any closer to us, any more involved with us, how could he be the underwriter of my world, the answer when my knowledge falls short, the helper when my moral striving needs recognition and a boost? My religion and my theology cannot come up with any other kind of God, nor does it need any other kind of God. But it would be a mistake to confuse this God, perfect as he may be, with the living God. It would be a mistake to confuse a theology of glory with witness to God. It would be a mistake, in Bonhoeffer's words, to bring God's mystery down to the flat, ordinary human wisdom of experience and reason. For contrary to our pious wishes, God is not a prisoner of himself. God does not deal with us by means of an immutable law across a vast distance, a law which we can, in effect, master, and in so doing, master God, even the perfect God, and have him all figured out before we eventually free ourselves from this self-incurred tutelage. No. God deals with us by grace, as a personal and living God. He deals with us in his freedom, and this includes freedom to dispose over his being. God's freedom means that he is able to come, even among us, to be with us as the God-human at the center of our life, so that we might stand before him continually. It is from this center, in our very humanity, that God then becomes involved even in something that is not the divine will, the night of the world, war, suffering even for one's enemies. He becomes involved with the shadow of death. Jesus is the embodiment, the incarnation of God's freedom. But Jesus is not only the self-expression of God in God's freedom. Jesus is at the same time the truth and the actuality of human freedom. He is therefore the possibility of our freedom. Bonhoeffer comments as follows. Jesus Christ is human and is God in one. In him, that takes place the essential and original encounter with us and with God. Henceforward, we cannot be conceived and known otherwise than in Jesus Christ. And God cannot be conceived and known otherwise than in the human form of Jesus Christ. In Jesus, 
We see humanity as that which God has accepted, born, and loved, and as that which is reconciled with God. In Jesus, we see God in the form of the poorest of our brothers and sisters. Implied in Bonhoeffer's comment is the view that just as God is not a prisoner of himself, but in freedom realizes his being in communion with us, so we too do not have to be prisoners of ourselves. Our humanity does not consist first and foremost in securing our being and enlisting God for the purpose when necessary. Nor does it consist in gradually taking the place of God as we push back the boundaries of knowledge and go on to create a world worthy of ourselves. To be free, insists Bonhoeffer, does not mean to be great in the world, to be free against our brothers and sisters, to be free against God, but it means to be free from ourselves. God's love frees us from ourselves to be free for others. We have been freed for God and for fellow human beings. And this is not the meaning, not only the meaning of our freedom, but it is the meaning of our humanity. A meaning determined and disclosed by God's own free self-determination, by his reconciling act in Jesus Christ. This notion of freedom as freedom from ourselves, and thus freedom for God and for others, has its background in Martin Luther's interpretation of Philippians 2. We should note in this connection that it was not Descartes Kant, Feuerbach, Marx, Nietzsche, or Freud, who were the first to take up the cause of freedom for those in bondage. At the dawn of the modern era, it was Luther and his associate Philip Melanchthon, who with their insistence on freedom brought attention back to St. Paul's teaching. In the first dogmatics text produced by the Reformation, Philip Melanchthon's Losi of 1521, we find the striking statement, freedom is Christianity. Luther elaborates the Christological structure of human freedom in his 1520 treatise, The Freedom of a Christian. In a nutshell, our mind, the orientation of our entire being, is to be like that of Jesus Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. For Luther, the subject of this self-emptying is not the Logos, but Jesus Christ, the God-man considered according to his humanity. To understand the significance, we should consider the alternative. It is not the eternal Logos who empties himself and surrenders or limits his divinity as he comes into the world. That the Logos should do this is both nonsensical and preposterous. This sort of interpretation is better suited to the stopgap God of human reason, for whom becoming a human being would mean a surrender or at best a limitation of his divinity. Instead, for Luther, it is Jesus Christ in the integrity of his person who now exists in the form of God because his humanity is God's very own humanity. This Jesus, according to his human nature, though so elevated, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but became obedient to the point of death. In other words, God did not surrender his divinity, but rather took our humanity up into the very life of God. 
Yet Jesus Christ, this very human who is also God, was not on that account, as Luther puts it, puffed up. Nor did he elevate himself above us and assume power over us. This, Luther continues, would have been perfectly within Christ's rights. But he chose a contrary way. He lived, worked, suffered, and died just like the rest of humanity. What is the significance of Christ's life for our freedom, for our humanity, which is now defined and determined by God's reconciling work? First of all, in Bonhoeffer's pointed words, escapism is prohibited. As those caught up into the way of Jesus Christ, Christians do not retreat from a secular into a spiritual sphere into an oasis of security, a gated community desperate for the rapture. Christians do not flee life in the world because they are better off, which they actually are through participation in the being of Jesus. But they do what Christ did. Even though he was in the very form of God, they too embrace all of life for the sake of God and for the sake of the neighbor. For the sake of God, because he is not a God of the boundary. And for the sake of the neighbor, because though the world is the world and the neighbor may be managing just fine, in Jesus Christ, the world is loved, condemned and reconciled to God. And the neighbor's own humanity is also Christ's very own. The Christian's involvement in the world is radical. So radical that their Christianity is in fact religionless. Christians do not carve out a niche in their lives for God and for the practice of Christianity. They are not religious, where religion is merely one activity among many. Rather, the whole of life is embraced in the Christological structure of our being. For Christianity is not something that we do, which we can put off or which can be crowded out by other activities. Christianity is what God has done to us through faith. It is a radical transformation at the root of our being. Christianity, Bonhoeffer observes, puts us into many different dimensions of life at the same time. We make room in ourselves to some extent for God and for the whole world. In fact, only faith itself, as that which frees us from ourselves, can make possible this multi-dimensional life. Christians' radical involvement in the world carries an important corollary. Christians are free from having to establish their identity, even their identity as Christians. There is no room for self-focused sanctification and individualistic perfectionism in the Christian life. Bonhoeffer comments, one must completely abandon any attempt to make something of oneself, whether it be a saint or a converted sinner or a churchman. One must instead live unreservedly in life's duties, problems, successes and failures, experiences and perplexities. In so doing, we throw ourselves completely into the arms of God. And further, to be a Christian does not mean to be religious in a particular way. To make something of oneself, a sinner, a penitent or a saint, on the basis of some method or other, but to be a person, not a type of person, but the person that Christ creates in us. Briefly put, the Christian is not a homo religiosus, a religious man. The Christian is simply a human, as Jesus was human. So what does this Christ form life, what does this Christ-formed life, a life free from the self, actually look like? 
under the cross, writes Bonhoeffer, God returns us to the earth and its work and toil. But in so doing, he binds us anew to the earth and to the people who live, act, fight, and suffer upon it. Suffering is the most important way in which Christians express the life of Jesus in them. We are summoned, Bonhoeffer observes, to share in God's sufferings at the hands of a godless world. It is not the religious act that makes the Christian, but participation in the sufferings of God, in the secular life. But Bonhoeffer also makes this regret-filled remark. There are many Christians who bend their knees before the cross of Jesus Christ well enough, but who do nothing but resist and struggle against every affliction in their own lives. They believe that they love Christ's cross, but they hate the cross in their own lives. Whoever regards suffering and trouble in their own life as something wholly hostile, wholly evil, can know by this, that they have not yet found peace with God at all. Now, Bonhoeffer also makes clear that Christians do not seek suffering because they do not seek themselves. Rather, as those who participate in the being of Jesus Christ and embrace the world just as he did in reconciling it to himself, Christians bear radical witness to the dignity of every human being even to the dignity of those who have no respect for human dignity, even to the humanity, however perverted and destitute, of their own enemies. We pray in fervent supplication, says Bonhoeffer, that God may bring all our enemies under the cross of Christ and grant them mercy. Christians are profoundly aware that the hungry need bread and the homeless need a roof, the dispossessed need justice, and the lonely need fellowship, the undisciplined need order, and the slaves need freedom. But by attending to these human needs, they prepare the way for the gospel. But in this, in this, they run afoul of those who trample human dignity underfoot, who profit from injustice, who seek their own security by undermining their own brothers and sisters, who enslave in the name of freedom and wage war under the banners of peace. Thus, Christians will inevitably suffer. And in the midst of their suffering, they will be tempted to run away or to lose patience with God. This reality of temptation makes clear something important. For all our suffering, we must be careful not to confuse ourselves with Christ. Bonhoeffer cautions. Christ endured all suffering and all human guilt to the full. Indeed, he was Christ in that he suffered everything alone. In the end, we cannot suffer with people in our own strength because we are unable to redeem. That we are at all able to suffer with those who suffer, that we are able to endure our own suffering, that we can withstand temptation and that we can follow in Christ's footsteps for the sake of fellow humans, all of this is due to the grace and mercy and the presence of God. We suffer not in weak acquiescence or surrender, not masochism, but growing stronger under the load as under God's grace, imperturbably, imperturbably preserving the peace of God. Thus, our suffering too is part of our witness to the gospel. To conclude, in Bonhoeffer, we encounter a forceful reminder that true freedom lies not in making our lives secure for ourselves, in the pursuit of answers and solutions, nor does freedom lie in getting a better, better grip on oneself in pursuit of personal improvement according to some ethical system or other. In short, true freedom 
lies not in our doing, but in what God has done and continues to do for us in Christ. In Christ, God determines his own freedom to be our God, God in our very humanity at the center of our lives. And this is not out of character for God. In Christ, God also calls us to freedom. Freedom to exhibit in our humanity the humanity of Christ. Freedom to rest in God's peace, freedom from consuming and destructive obsession with ourselves. In Christ, God calls us to freedom to realize our humanity in being there for the neighbor. Even the neighbor who suffers or who makes us suffer. By God's grace, this is not out of character for us either. And through all that, as Bonhoeffer tirelessly reminds us, God does not want to take God's peace from us. Throughout, we experience God's power and victory through Christ, the center of our lives. Amen. And the peace of God, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.